I'm gonna see I'm on Lumber Alert. Hello. Hello everyone. Who's all in here? Thirteen people are waiting. All right. Okay, let me go make my tea. <laughs> everyone hello welcome to my channel if you're new here hi my name is Pat Mari welcome to my channel so before we get into this video I'm gonna try to make this really really quick I just want to briefly explain what's going on um, because if you have been watching my videos for a while you'll know that I've never done this before so basically if you don't already know Fijians and Pacific Islanders from all over the world have been having these virtual meetings via zoom for I believe it's been a few weeks now that we have been doing this we've had uh, folks from the UK Australia New Zealand Fiji here in the US and others around the world tuning in so basically in these zoom meetings we discuss things such as racism and colorism um, etc and we have discussions and debates kind of about issues pertaining to our community I understand that these can be touchy subjects and if you don't like something that's said or you disagree of course you should voice your opinions but please do so in a respectful manner palm squad I know y'all have manners I feel like I'm talking to children <laughs> palm squad I know y'all have manners and it's always good vibes here so I would just like to continue that as we engage in these meaningful discussions with one another in the comment section even if you don't understand something, please ask and maybe I'll respond if I see it or someone else will see it and have an answer for you. So yeah, some of us Fijians here in the US wanted to host tonight's discussion and our topic, as you can see in the title, is Fijian identity, past, present, future. Uh, I had some technical difficulties where the Zoom, Zoom recording only shows the speaker rather than the gallery view where you can see everyone. If you don't know what I mean, you'll see in a little bit. Um, but it's fine. We're all still new to this. So there's going to be trial and error. I also want to mention that I was not originally planning on uploading this on my channel, but we decided as a group to utilize the platform that I do have where the majority of my viewers are Fijian and reside in Fiji. This information can be of use to y'all. So I feel like I can reach a lot of people who may want or even need to learn this information and honestly whether you live in Fiji or overseas I guarantee you'll take something away from this discussion it's literally impossible not to learn something after watching this video unless you're trying really hard not to listen um, so yeah that's all I have to say for now my brother Save will be leading tonight's discussion and we are so excited to have Dr. Ponipate Rokole Kutu I hope I said that right as our guest speaker Sabe will be introducing him in just a bit, and if you don't already know who Dr. Ponipati is, well, you're gonna want to get to know him after this. Okay, let's go. Okay, I'm sorry. I can hear. Bula. Don't bula, my center Rosa. Everyone in waiting room. There are people in the waiting room. Yeah. How? Where's the? Where does it say that they're? No, no. I'm trying to get everybody in. It's just they keep refreshing, and there's still more coming in. What does it say that people are? It says that the there are some people in the waiting room. You mainly are letting people I'm in right now. So, but yeah, we're trying to get everybody in before this starts. Doctor Pony, are you there? Maybe cannot buy to go to the pool. Like, I think we can begin now. Eh? So, I'm just going to briefly explain uh, the format of, of our discussion today. I think this uh, came out of uh, uh, one of our past discussions around um, what we're going to do to help um, our folks back in Fiji during this. Uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I think it came out of that. That was going to be uh, the main crux of what we're going to be talking about um, today. So I'll just introduce um, uh, the agenda for today. So we're just going to be doing uh, establishing some of the ground rules for um, this discussion, 
again, this is just an informal discussion. Uh, and uh, some of the, the rules we came up with was uh, we're going to have one person, one mic. We're not going to uh, be talking over another person. If you have something to say, there's, I believe there's an icon where you can uh, raise your hand. Secondly, uh, we're going to make space take space, which means that you're going to make space for other people to share their views and be cognizant of the space you're taking up um, in the discussion. Uh, thirdly, introduce yourself before you ask a question or make a comment so that people know where you're coming from um, uh, in the context of the discussions we're going to be having. And lastly, use I statements so that you're not uh, uh, generalizing or using generalized statements um, during the duration of this uh, discussion. So second, we're going to give a moment to Dr. Punipati to describe uh, one of the topics for today. So we engaged him um, as early as uh, yesterday um, to talk about this recurring uh, theme of Fijian identity that we've been talking about. Uh, and I think that uh, his scholarship has informed a lot of his uh, ideas around uh, what it means to be a Fijian uh, past, present, and future, which is what's going to undergird our discussion um, today. So I'll let him speak on that um, briefly uh, after I go through the agenda. Uh, thirdly, we're going to, again, go back to um, engaging some of our folks back home and talking to them about just brainstorming around what are some ways uh, we as uh, overseas Fijians can, can aid um, you folks in, in during this difficult time. And, and um, I believe any, um, uh, we're entertaining any uh, input at this point uh, to try to uh, formulate some action steps moving forward. And then lastly, uh, putting all that together and um, uh, figuring out how we can uh, address this issue. So without further ado, I'm just gonna um, move this over to Dr. Pony. Um, to describe uh, his bio, uh, having um, done his uh, bachelor's degree at uh, USB uh, and I believe his master's and um, a PhD at the University of uh, Hawaii, um, being also the first uh, Fijian PhD uh, candidate to graduate, um, political science candidate to graduate from the university. Dr. Pony. Uh, thank you, Sabe. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me. Uh, okay, Sabe. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I noticed that there are sixty-one uh, participants in this forum. So first of all, I'd like to thank you, Sabe, uh, Sabe Masawai, for organizing this uh, forum organizing this opportunity to allow young people to talk about this very important topic, identity, <clears throat> uh, Fijian identity uh, in, the, in the special context. As I talk about, you know, as I think about the Itaoke identity, I think about it in two contexts. One is in the broader context of the diaspora, uh, whether you are living in the United Kingdom, Australia or New Zealand, or in the United States. Uh, that's the first context. The other context is in the context of the of the 21st century, particularly in terms of uh, you know globalization, and in terms of uh, um, uh, this uh, global threat of climate change. What does it mean to be it okay in the context of globalization? Uh, what does it mean to be an it okay in the context of a uh, impending you know, a, a catastrophe of, or that is induced by climate change. And so, um, you know, as a, as a Itaoke, um, as a scholar and a, as a Itaoke, um, when I walk into the classroom, when I teach, or every time I'm invited to participate in a public engagement, I walk in not as a scholar, but as an Ita, okay, that's the first thing. And secondly, I walk in as, uh, as a Matanibonua. I'm a chief spokesman. Uh, I walk into my classroom as a Matanibonua. And so when I teach, when I uh, engage in public engagement, 
I assume my my identity is a Ita okay and is a Matinwala. So I represent a people, and I represent the the you know the particular uh, stratum, if you like, that I come from. You know the stratum of the of the Itauke society. You have the chiefs, you have the Sauturanga, you have the Matinvanua, you have the Wanendau, and then the strata goes on uh, to the bottom of the strata of, of the of the hierarchy. And so, uh, and so, I said that to say that this identity is very important. And I am so pleased as a you know as as, as a scholar uh, to be part of this uh, forum that talks about identity. Uh, let me first uh, talk about my reflection of identity in the context of the diaspora, whether you are living in New Zealand or Australia, uh, the United Kingdom or you know, uh, in the United States. Uh, what does it mean to be Nita Oke in the diaspora? You know, uh, one of the one of the things that uh, is important for us to to recognize and to to be cognizant about, and that is uh, the process of colonialism. This is a process that affects everybody. It affects you. It affects me. It affects your your parents, your grandparents. It affects generation of people of color, and the Pacific Islands, and certainly Fiji is not an exception. And so. Uh, one of the things that colonialism does, colonialism amongst its uh, various uh, objectives is that colonialism is a project of racial denigration. This is important. What does that mean? It means that when the whites came, they instilled this notion that our language is not important, our culture is not important, and you as an indigenous person is not important. In fact, all of these are obstruction to the promotion of capitalism. This is an economic system that you and I are part of. And this is an economic system. Remember this, capitalism is not an economic system that values your identity. Capitalism is not an economic system that values your culture, your language, and what is constitutive of you as an indigenous person. In other words, capitalism doesn't value your sense of indigeneity. Capitalism is an economic system that is predicated on a couple of things. One is the exploitation of the environment. Two, capitalism you know, uh, thrives on white privileges. Capitalism thrives on the exploitation of people of color. You know, today we are consumed by Black Lives Matter. When you look at the history of Black Lives Matters, it's a history of slavery driven by capitalism. Slavery is driven by a capitalist agenda. But it's more than that. You know, capitalism is also an economic system that exploits the natural environment. Capitalism thrives on the exploitation of people, people of color. Capitalism also thrives on the denigration of you, who you are as an indigenous person. And so uh, what does that mean for us, for you in this 21st century? How do, you, how, do you, how do you deploy yourself? How do you position yourself in the context of the diaspora? You know, in the United States, we, um, the United States has a culture of assimilation, that you get assimilated into an American culture. That means you speak the American language, you embrace the American technology, you embrace the, you know, the, the American lifestyle, which is, you know, based on, on mass production and mass consumption. You have so many canvas, you have so many t-shirts, you have so many underwears, you have so many of everything, you have so many, you have a lot, right? And so when you, and that is, that is the American culture, a culture of mass consumption, right? And you, and you know, and one of the things that young people your age do is to, you know, to speak the language, the lingua of the, of, of the, of the country that you have become assimilated into. That means to speak in English, that means to embrace the technology and all the rest of it, you know. But this is so important, you know, uh, uh, as a Fijian, it is important 
to realize that capitalism doesn't value who you are. And so how do we deal with that? One of the ways of dealing with it is to value your own culture. If you're thinking of a, a, a decolonial mindset, you know, the colonial mindset is for you to speak in English. A colonial mindset is for you to call your parents mom and dad. A colonial mindset is for you to play video games. A colonial mindset is for you to speak with a slang. You know, if you grow up in the United Kingdom, you know, you, you speak with an accent. And that is indicative of progress. That's what, you know, that's what, it, you know, that's what the Western education system teaches us. And one of the things that it denigrates is who you are as an Itauke, as an indigenous Fijians. And so as a scholar, let me be categorical about this, that your, your cutting edge, your cutting edge as an Itauke is your language, is your culture, is your indigenous uh, knowledge system. This is what anchors you. If you do not, if you cannot speak your language, if you do not know your, your traditional epistemolog is epistemologies, which is, which is your knowledge system, if you do not know your culture, then you are a, lo then you are a lost person. Because you know what? Capitalism doesn't value you. Capitalism, the economic system, is an economic system of the whites. It privileges the white. It doesn't privilege you. And so this is important when you talk about, uh, you know, identity, our identity. You are only important to the extent where you are able to speak your language, know your traditional knowledge system, and know who you are. It is important to know who you are, isn't it okay? Because if you don't know that, you will not prosper in the diaspora. You will not participate productively and progressively in the context of the diaspora. You have to be anchored in who you are as an indigenous Fijian. You have to be anchored in your indigenous knowledge system. You have to be anchored in your identity, isn't it okay? This is, this is your cutting edge, your identity. And so uh, in the diaspora, therefore, you know, when you are in indigenous region and diaspora, you possess a dual identity. One is your identity as an indigenous region. You know the language, you know the culture, you know the relationships, and you, and you know, you know, the traditional knowledge systems. The other is your, you also master, you know, the modern world. You, you can also be an American speaking the language of the American or, or, or in the United Kingdom, you speak the, the language of diaspora, which is English, right? You embrace the technology, you participate, you know, in the social interaction in the, in the context of the diaspora. And so this what makes you, you know, this was this dual personality, this dual character of both an indigenous person and the person of the modern world an indigenous person and the person of the diaspora makes you, makes you strong and enriches you. You know, you cannot speak English fluently without speaking the vernacular language effectively. This, this is important. You cannot learn somebody else's culture without being grounded in your own culture. There is a misconception that when you live in the diaspora, that you need to speak in English. There is a misconception that English, that your ability to speak in English is a sign of progress. You know, that's a misconception. That this is what I find, you know, this is what I find out as a scholar, teaching in a metropolitan space like the United States and the universities in the States in one of the universities in San Francisco. And that is, my cutting edge is who I am as an indigenous Fijian. My cutting edge is my ability to speak my language and to embrace my identity, my narratives, and where I come from. That is important. 
And this is something that Europeans, you know, this is what colonization does. The, col col the, the colonial project teaches you, you know, to denigrate your own identity, your own culture, and everything that comes with your sense of indigeneity. Think about, you know, I, I want you to think about African-Americans. Think about African-Americans. People who are uprooted from Africa through what was called the transatlantic slavery, or slave trade, right? They were uprooted and they came and they were enslaved. And they lost everything. A part of, a part, amongst the things that they lost was culture their culture and their identity. They lost that. When you look at African Americans today, you're looking at a generation of people who have lost their soul because they don't know their culture. They don't know their language. The only culture that resonates with them is American culture. But the American culture doesn't embrace them. And that's the same thing with us as indigenous Fijians. You know, as much as you are educated, as much as you are acculturated, as much as you are assimilated into the American culture or the English culture, to those of you who live in the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, you are not part of that culture. Capitalism and Western culture will not give you a sense of significance like your culture. You have to be rooted in your culture. You have to know how to speak your language. You have to know and value and embrace social relationships that are part of that sense of indigeneity, isn't it okay? That's what gives you importance. And so identity in the context of diaspora is dual. Your sense of indigeneity and your sense of uh, navigating yourself around you know capitalism around metropolitan spaces like the united states and other kings and elsewhere right and so you have you know when you have this dual identity when you have this dual identity you become very powerful you become very productive right you become very complex as opposed to to being a white you know the white they they because they have a single they have a single identity the only language they know is English. The only economic system they know is capitalism, which is a very exploitative system. But you as an you, you as an it okay, you have this a vibrant indigenous identity. You speak your language, you are rooted in your culture, you are rooted in your social relationships, you are rooted in your indigenous system, knowledge systems, and at the same time, you are also able to, to live progressively in the modern space, in the diaspora. This is, this is what makes me, as an indigenous Fijian, you know, very, very influential, very powerful, uh, contributing, you know, to the diaspora in, in, in the context of the United States, for instance. And so, you know, and so it is important, you know, when Savi asked me to participate in this, I'm not really sure of the content of this conversation, but, uh, my understanding of this is to talk on the importance of culture and identity, that your culture and identity is important. Your culture and identity is important. Your culture is an indigenous Fijian. Your language is an indigenous Fijian. Your dialect is indigenous Fijian. Because if you do not know how to speak your language, if you do not know your indigenous system, you know, indigenous knowledge system, you'll not be able to do well in the, in the modern economy. You will not be able to learn effectively in university. Think about that. Those who are grounded in their culture and identity do very well in university, do very well in the modern economy because they're grounded, they know who they are. Because the capitalism, the capitalist economic system doesn't privilege you. The capitalist economic system functions and thrives on white privileges, on the exploitation of people of color, on the exploitation of natural resources, and the exploitation of everything else. That, includes, that, that means it denigrates you. As much as you and I participate in this capitalist economic system, this is an economic system that doesn't privilege you. It positions you into a subservient position. And your only cutting edge is your soul, 
is your identity as an indigenous Fijian? If I may, I was uh, I was also reading up on your um, on this topic of uh, dual personalities and how um, having two different frame of reference can inform a lot of uh, the ways we we can um, thrive in academia because we're able to look at scenarios from two different perspectives from your indigenous perspective you can contextualize it in that perspective and you can contextualize it in the frame of reference of the adopted country um, that you're in and then there's this other thing about the the idea of arriving this i believe goes for most of us who have left um fiji and are in the diaspora wherever we are um, I, I believe some of the the themes that were coming out was that some people felt that uh um, speaking their language wasn't functional in this society um, because one, people uh, who don't speak your language make fun of you just by hearing how you sound um, uh, in their midst. And the second thing is, I think this uh, really seeps into a lot of this self um, hatred. I've, I've been guilty of this too. It's you know coming through high school and in college and, and and making sure that I'm not speaking or cooking food that, that, that disturbs the, the, the scent of other people who have never heard of seasoning in their lives. And I think that um, a lot of these uh, microaggressions tend to alienate us from, from assuming our identity. And I'm hearing that you're saying that having this dual frame of reference can really um, help us uh, contextualize these, these scenarios, uh, whether it's in the classroom or outside of the classroom, um, and, and, and it informs a lot of those, uh, the way we, uh, we think about these issues. So how, could, could you talk more about this, this idea of, of we have arrived um, that you talk about in some of your other talks as well? Thank you, thank you, Sami. The notion of arrival, yes. Um, you know, we as indigenous Fijians, we are new to the diaspora. We just got into the diaspora a decade ago or perhaps a decade and a half ago. Uh, when you look at the, you know, the history of diaspora Pacific Islanders, the Tongans, the Samoans, and the Micronesians. In fact, most of the Pacific Island countries that are associated with the United States, the compact island nations like Palau, the Marshall Islands, and the Federal States of Micronesia, uh, places like American Samoa, places like uh, you know, Guam and the Northern Marianas, um, these are people who arrived here almost, uh, you know, immediately after the Second World War. They came. They were already, you know, engaged in the diaspora immediately after the Second World War. So when you talk about uh, Pacific Islanders here, uh, these Pacific Islanders have been here, you know, fourth, fifth generation today. When you talk about indigenous Fiji and the diaspora of the Itaoke in particular, uh, we came, you know, in the influx of it, okay, in the diaspora began in the late uh, 18, in the late 1980s, you know, after the Second World War, uh, after, the, after the first military coup. But there's an interesting thing about this. You know, United States, Australia, New Zealand, they softened the immigration policies to allow Indians because they were supposedly victimized by the military coups of 1987. There were two coups in 1980. Right, they softened. So the immigration policies was, was uh, you know, in favor of Indo-Fijians, of Fijians, of Indian ancestry, to be politically correct. And so we were the afterthought. Indigenous Fijians, you know, then, you know, took advantage of that soft immigration policies that was, that was initially, you know, tailor-made, that was initially you know, stipulated for Indians, who were supposedly victims of the second coup, of the first and second coup. So, nevertheless, we are the recent arrivals, right? And um, the notion of the recent arrival is that, you know, once we arrived, we think that uh, coming to the United States is constitutive of the final stage of economic development. You know, if you think, of, if you think about Rostov's model of economic development, Rostov's uh, an economist. He, you know, he theorizes uh, five stages of economic development, and the final stage is the arrival 
arrival to uh, the, the, the arrival stage. You arrive at the final stage of economic development. To most of us indigenous Fijians, just coming to the United States, we think, oh, we have arrived. Because now we are driving the car that we could not afford to drive in Fiji. We're living in affluent apartments that we could not even dream of living in in Fiji. But that is a misconception. We just arrived. We have, yes, we have arrived in the diaspora, but we have not arrived in the final stage of development. This is the beginning of a people. This is a stage of the beginning of a people to then make a life out of this. And this is why people like Save plays an important role. You know, Save, when you look at his uh, history, his narratives of education, and, and, uh, and countless other indigenous Fijians, you know, who came to study, whose parents came to, you know, you know brought their families in. And you see people who struggle. This is a land of opportunity. And so when I talk about the notion of, of arrival, I want you to be uncomfortable. We have not arrived. Yes, we have arrived in the United States, but you have a responsibility to better your life, not through caregiving, not through working at Walmart. You have to make a life for yourself. And one of the ways of doing that is to follow the path that people like Sabe and Masai Wai followed, you know, enroll in the university, work hard to get an education and come back to your community in the United States to help build your community. Right? We have, you, your generation, you have a responsibility to fight for economic and political justice. And so the notion of arrival is something that um, you should, um, you know, uh, uh, um, expand upon. That you've just not, yes, you've arrived, but this is an opportunity for you to make the most of it. And I want to appeal to you. And I want to appeal to young people in the United States, those of you who have papers, those of you who have, who, you know, what's often referred to as a regularized immigration status, to make use of the resources that are available. Get an education, come back and fight for economic and social justice. And so, um, Sabe, uh, yeah, that is uh, my discussion on the notion of arrival. Thank you, Dr. Pony. I believe uh, Abdul has a, uh... Uh, question he wanted to ask. Abdul, unmute yourself. Oh, sorry. I put it in the chat. No, I just, I, I was just listening. And uh, I heard the doctor mention supposedly uh, victims of the 1987 coup. So I just wanted to get a perspective on was it, were Indians, were indo fijians victims of the 1987 coup or were they supposedly and allegedly victims of 1987 coup? Uh, David, uh, who, who was that? Uh, can, can you repeat the question? It's a very important question. Can you repeat it again? Uh, sorry, I'm Abdul. I'm from Fiji. I live in Fiji. I'm an Indo-Fijian. Uh, so I was listening to the conversation and I heard you mention that uh, in terms of immigration policy, that aside, uh, that Indo-Fijians were supposedly victims of the 1987 coup. So I was just focusing on the word supposedly. Yeah. It kind of means to me that they might or might not have been. So I was just mm -hmm. trying to get a idea from you on what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use, I use the word supposedly very strategically and, and, and I meant to use it because uh, at the outset, you know, the 1987 coup um, was a coup that was orchestrated against Fijians of Indian ancestry, right? It was a, a race-based coup at the outset. But retrospectively, you know, as a Itauke myself, and in the course of my research, I found that, you know, uh, not only were the Indians victimized by it, or Fijians of Indians, in, in, um, the Fijians were, you know, it okay, were, were also victimized by it because they were sacrificed. They were used as a scapegoat to legitimize a military coup that was executed against, you know, it okay elitism. Abdul, does it make sense to you? Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, I was thinking that I would expand on the same context that uh, when it came to the Itoke people themselves, they did not ask for this. It was the elite few who used the identity to perpetuate this and made it into a 
race-based thing. So yeah, I, I think you, you said the same thing that I was thinking. Yes, and, and, and I'm glad that you raised this, you know, because race, you know, the coup has been used as a race-based thing. But when you, you know, when you, when you look at it critically, it's not a race-based thing. The coup was about promoting a certain class of indigenous Fijian interest. It's a, it's a class-based Itauke interest. Because if it was executed in the name of indigenous Fijians, then the economic condition of the overwhelming majority of indigenous Fijians would have improved by now. And as you know, you live in Fiji, that you know, the overwhelming majority of indigenous Fijians are still you know, living in scarcity in both the villages and native reserves. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pony. I think uh, the last... Um point that I wanted to, uh, to address here is your, your dissertation where you talk about land dispossession uh, for indigenous Fijians. I don't believe that's a, a topic that's very uh, widely discussed within uh, even uh, Indo, uh, sorry, Itauke settings. And I think uh, just, just providing a, a context on that and, and uh, how that informed your, um, your scholarship when you were at the University of Hawaii. Thank you, Sabe. Uh, to young people who are listening in today, I noticed that there are 97 people. <laughs> I am so impressed about your participation in this forum. You know, um, when I embarked on this journey, uh, you know, uh, studying, you know, uh, doing my master's and doing a PhD, I was not necessarily interested in becoming a scholar. I was not necessarily interested in becoming, you know, a professor. No, my interest was not to be in academia. I was not interested in becoming an academic. I was interested in understanding the disconnect between Itoke ownership of land, on the one hand, the supposed indigenous Fijian ownership of land, and the economic marginalization, the reality, the supposed ownership of land, and the reality of the economic marginalization of indigenous Fijians on the other. Because I lived and experienced, you know, those uh, kind of economic marginalization. I grew up in our native reserve, right? And uh, often when I was growing up, I often wonder, you know, my grandfather used to tell me, listen, you know, the land is ours right? The Indians are here to lease. But I noticed that we, the supposed landowners, live, you know, in, in thatched homes, in substandard homes, while Indo-Fijians or Fijians of Indian ancestry who are leasing the land seems to live in better homes. They have, uh, you know, bathrooms and toilets inside their homes. They, seem, you know, they have vehicles. They seem to eat good food, they travel overseas, right? While my people, the supposed owners of the land, we still live in poverty, in scarcity. We struggle every day. I remember, you know, we eat row row almost every day. You know, uh, we eat eggplant, the kinds of food we eat, you know, and the and the whole lifestyle that we live, living in substandard homes, living in scarcity. And I often wonder, why is, why is it that we are landowners and we're living in scarcity? And so I was driven by, by, by the quest to understand the disconnect. And that's why, you know, I, I, you know, I did my research to find out exactly what is the disconnect. I wanted to understand this, the paradoxical condition of the Itoke. What is that? The fact that they own, that they, you know, think about Fiji. Land is Fiji's, um, you know, means of production. Fiji's economic development is predicated on one thing, on land. 91% of the land supposedly belong to indigenous Fijians. In other words, indigenous Fijians, or they okay, are the owners of the means of production. That means they're supposed to be economically empowered, but they are not. They live in deprivation. They struggle to put food on the table. 
You know, I remember when I was in high school, I was sent so many times back home because, you know, my parents could not afford to pay my tuition. Think about that. And yet, I am a landowner. And yet, my grandfather was, uh, you know, Martin Ipanua. And we are supposed to be landowners. And yet, here, you know, we've been sent back to school, sent back home because our fees... You could not, you know, parents couldn't pay our fees. How do you reconcile? How do you reconcile, you know, landowners and economic marginalization, deprivation, scarcity? I was driven by that, right? And I found out that this thing, this this thing called lease, this thing called lease. You see, um, the Hawaiians lost their land; it was taken away from them. American Indians have had their land taken away from them, right? Aborigines of Australia had their land taken away from them. Seized. Indigenous Fijians, the land was not taken away from them. This is something convoluted, you know, complex about Indigenous Fijians, that our land was not taken away. It was not seized, like what happened with the Aborigines of Australia, the Maoris of New Zealand, the Canucks of New Caledonia, the Native American Indians of, you know, of North America. But our land was taken away through this thing called lease. This lease, this lease thing, what does it mean? It means that, you know, indigenous Fijians lease their land to non Itauke, you know, the Indo Fijians in the sugar industry, to Chinese, and to Australians, to Americans, in the tourism industry, real estate development, we lease the land. But this concept of lease is disingenuous. This the idea of lease is a form of, lead, of land dispossession. Our land, Itauke land, was not taken away. It was not seized, but it was leased. This is this is a this is a um, and, you know this is a, a complex way of land alienation, land alienation through an institutional an institutional leasing arrangement. Land was taken away through lease. Right? Where do indigenous regions live? We live in the native reserve, while the best part of our land is leased for economic development. What do indigenous regions get? They get leased money. Right? What kind of lease money? Lease money that was not based on the market value of the land. Right? Even today, you know, let me give an example. My father called last week. You know, he excitedly told me, oh, we got our lease money. I said, oh, wow, wonderful. How much was it? $40. That's what they got. That's what my father got, $40. And yet, his land has been used to subsidize the economic development of the Fijian state. Somebody else is get millions of dollars out of that land, while my father got only $40. This notion of lease is disingenuous. This notion of lease gives the illusion to indigenous Fijians that the land is theirs. It's an illusion. No, the land is already taken away through lease. 99 years of lease, perpetual leasing arrangement through lease, you know, perpetual leasing arrangement is a convoluted way of land alienation. This is something that continues to, you know, bother me. You know, it bothers me today, just as how it bothers me in the past. And uh, yeah, something that is sort of the crux of what I wanted to say about the institutional leasing arrangement, mm -hmm. uh, that is the means of land dispossession. There's another notion about that this land is possession. This notion of land is possession, the lease, is camouflaged by the notion of, uh, you know, um, um, British colonial benevolence. Think about that. If you read the colonial literature, colonization, there's nothing good. Colonization is always about exploitation. Colonization is about oppression. Colonization is about racial denigration. Colonization is about the exploitation of people and the environment. Colonization is about this word. This word. This, take note of this word. Evisceration. Colonization is about evisceration. To eviscerate. What does it mean to eviscerate? It's to gut. Think about a fish. You catch a fish and you gut the fish. You take the life out of the fish. That's what colonization is. You take the very thing that gives indigenous people life, you take it away. That's what colonization is. And yet in the case of Fiji, when you read the colonial literature on Fiji, you come across very often this notion of colonial benevolence, that the, that the British were benevolent, that they were, you know, they came to protect indigenous Fijians. But that was not true. That was a camouflage, to camouflage, 
Good luck, uh, Dr. Pony. There's also a question um, in the chat room by Jessica. She, he, she's asking, what are your views um, on the land bank that was set up by the Fiji government? And then there's another one by Lana who um, also asked, as a landowner and someone who receives lease, oh no, she, she just commented, I still have to apply to TLTB and lease a piece of land. So I guess the question yeah. is uh, Jessica's yeah, question yeah. about the land bank. You, you, as a landowner, you still apply. Think about that, think about, okay, let me address the, first, the second question. Think about that, right? To the, how many people who are tuning in today? 98 people, think about that. If you are an indigenous Fijian, if you are an Itauke, and you own the land. Why do you have to apply for lease if you own the land? You know, in the normative uh, capitalist sense, if you're the landowner, then you are the owners of the means of production. You you can you can use your land to you know to benefit uh, financially, economically. But in the case of Fiji. You have to lease again, this notion of lease, right? You know, this is a complicated argument. It's a very complicated argument. Uh, you know, the, the, the case of Fiji, the land tenure system, the economic condition of Fiji, Fiji as a colonial project was an intellectual project. It was intellectual project. What do I mean by that? It was crafted. The land tenure system was informed by intellect. It was informed by Western anthropologists. It was informed by, um, you know, Western intellect, and they crafted it. The paradoxical condition of it, okay, is a product of the intellectual project. But let me, uh, you know, the, the second question is, you know, if you're a landowner, you have to apply to TLTB, right? Now, TLTB is an institution established by the colonial state, right? This is an institution that controls, right? When you, if you have time, I want you to go back and read, if you have time, Google this two land legislation. One is the Native Land Ordinance. Right, this native land ordinance was enacted in, 18, in 1880 and it was modified in 1966, I, guess. I think it was modified in 1966. And then also read the Native Land Trust Act. But let me focus on the Native Land Trust Act. Section three of the Native Land Trust Act. Take note of this, write, write it down. And when you have time, read them, right? The Native Land Trust Act, section three of it. Section three of it states that the control, the control of all native lands shall rest with TLTB. It was formerly called the Native Land Trust Board. And so if you look at section one, it says section one of the, of the same act articulates or stipulates that Fijian land is owned by the Matangali. So section one talks about ownership by the Matangali, right? Interestingly, section three talks about the control. And so Matangali may own the land, but the control of the land rests with TLTB. What does that mean? The TLTB determines who to lease the land or, or determines the ways in which one uses the land. You can use the land through lease or you can use the land by virtue of belonging to the Matangali. So the TLTB administers two kinds of land tenure system, two kinds of of accessibility to land. One is through lease, contractual leasing a great, uh, uh, arrangement. This is given to non OK, to corporation, through lease. The other one is customary rights of access by virtue of belonging to the Matangai. This, the first one is legal entitlement to land. The second one is customary entitlement to land, right? Guess what? If you want to, if you want to, you know, uh, apply for, housing loan, for instance. You go to housing to the bank, the bank will ask you, uh, you know, you, you go to the bank and say, you know, I want a loan, uh, build a home on my land. The, the bank will ask you, do you have a lease title to that land? You don't have a lease title to that land. You only have customary rights of access. The bank doesn't recognize the customary rights of access, but a non okay who leases the land and goes to the bank with that lease document, that person, has legal rights of access to the Fijian land. That person can secure the loan from the bank to build a, a home. 
a house. Sabi, am I making myself? Yes, uh, I, I believe there's a couple of people who want to ask some questions. So we'll just uh, let them un unmute themselves and ask the question. Yeah. We'll take uh, two. Um, I'll do first. I will drop it. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'll wait. I'll wait. Hello. Yeah. Oh, Bali the cow. Balidakau, <laughs> oh, when taking back a nilisi, where a vaca may be not can away came in a very long time and get limitangari, a tango macan and money tete, Kevoca, a sang and a lisi, when I was at a tenga and is at the convicu alike. And then the Gurna, you know, that is, let me respond to it for the benefit of those who are in the campus and the vehicle. I see Abdul is there. Uh, and so, Abdul, this is important for you to list, to, you know, to understand, Abdul, as, as a Fijian of Indian ancestry. You know, um, uh, the question was, why is it that we as indigenous Fijians uh, have problems with, with using our native reserve? Or the question is, uh, why can't we lease our own land? You know, uh, Bale, Bale Dakao talks about security. She wants security. She's a landowner. She wants security in the native reserve. Remember, the land in Fiji is divided into two. One is the, the native reserve, exclusively reserved for, for the members of the Matangai. And one is outside of the native reserve. This one is for contractual leasing arrangement given to non Itoke, right? And so uh, Balinakao's question is that in the native reserve, when we want to you know, extend our farm, right? Extend our plantation, you know, we've been limited. Right, and so she was saying, you know, I want security. In other words, what Malinaka was saying is that I want to lease my land so that I can have private property rights on this geographical location. Malinaka, is that what you want? Uh, yes, that's <laughs> that's what I was. Yeah, you want security. Mm -hmm. You want some kind of private property rights over your land, right? Yes, but I that's can't get. Yeah, that's what Itoke wants, right? The lease, the lease agreement, those who have contractual leasing agreements, right, through lease, they have private property rights for the duration initially under the outer 30 years. Now it's 99 years. Land has been leased to non Itoke for 99 years. And so within the duration of 99 years, you know, the lessee has private property rights over that land. But what Mali Vakao is saying, okay, to those of us who live in the native reserve, right? Okay, if you want to engage in commercial agriculture, you only have, you know, designated small piece of land within the native reserve, which is not enough for commercial agriculture, right? This is why it is important to allow indigenous region to lease their own land. Naka, uh, I believe PK also has a question in uh, Chope Tarai. Chope Tarai, Chope Tarai is part of this forum as well? Yes, he is. He sure is. Good uh, right. PK, ask your question first before Chop. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chop. Uh, yeah, yeah. Dumbula, Dr. Pony, uh, thank you so much for uh, just again taking your time to uh, uh, expound uh, to some of us who are trying to learn more about uh, ourselves and our culture. Uh, Naivangunga o Pinyuni o Ngoneni Ngalota Vuki Kandavu. I just uh, have. Um, I think some, uh, maybe one or two comments and then maybe sort of uh, uh, a question. I just wanted to hear your thoughts on. Um, you touched a bit uh, earlier on on uh, using our culture, our identity as an Itauke, um, finding roots in that as leverage in, a, uh, in the capitalist uh, system that's uh, very uh, biased towards the, the structures of uh, of, uh, of white privilege, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. Um, oh, we also live in a we also we also live in a time where um, 
uh, there's a lot of uh, deconstruction of uh, ideas, uh, theories, and even identities. Um, and uh, this is happening uh, a lot in, uh, uh, in uh, spaces of uh, education, uh, spaces uh, yeah. of literature. Um, I think the, uh, I, I was just uh, thinking, uh, and maybe I would like to hear your thoughts on um, the Itoke uh, culture, and uh, there's a, a lot of our structures are deeply uh, or initially rooted, uh, uh, if I can say, in uh, colonialism. Um, and uh, with uh, you, you were saying uh, earlier about uh, finding roots in uh, in who we are as as an Itoke in a, a system that is uh, biased towards uh, white privilege and uh, uh, the the structures of capitalism, uh, but at the same time faced with the challenges of uh, deconstructing uh, colonialism, uh, the structures um, induced by uh, by white people or white uh, uh, white privilege. I, I don't know if I make sense. Uh, how do we sort of, I don't know, marry the two? Where does the deconstruction stop? Uh, because if we keep deconstruction, then who am I as as an it okay? Uh, I don't know if that that makes sense. Uh, okay. O okay. What's your name again? I'm sorry. Uh, Penny. 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 Yes. <laughs> Penny. Thank you for your question. Wow. Intelligent question. And. Um, I don't know if I have an intelligent response to it. <laughs> but this is, uh, okay, if I understood your question, you're talking about, uh, you know, how do you reconcile uh, yes. the importance of indigeneity in the context of, uh, you know, a mod modern economy, in the context of an increasingly globalized, modernized world. Yes. And, uh, and a decolonial curriculum. Yes. How do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, um, you know it's the same thing. If you want to, uh, um, you know, uh, what what what's the first part again? Penny, Penny, I'm sorry. sorry. You know, yes, yes. ask me. This is my this is my happy <laughs> hour. I, this is the time. I'm already enjoying my wine. You know. This, I would appreciate if this was done in the morning. This is a wine, wine time. And so my, my brain is already, you know, in the wine uh, mode. Um, uh, um, how do I marry, um, I guess, my, um, my culture that's deeply rooted, or, or my, my history as an Itoke, and even our structures as Itoke that's deeply rooted in colonialism with... Um, uh, yeah. with, yeah. Okay, I, I think the it. idea of deconstruction, and, yes. And the idea of deconstruction, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. You know, Penny, uh, your question is very complicated and uh, you, you talk about a culture that is deeply rooted in colonialism, right? That's, that, that's very true. You know, the culture, the, the, your sense of indigeneity today, Penny, your identity, you know, is a colonial construct. This is something, you know, complicated about the case of Fiji because our indigenous identity is a colonial construct. And that is why it is important to develop a decolonial, you know, this word called pedagogy, you know, a decolonial pedagogy. I don't like using that word. It sounds like a disease, but you know, it's a, it's, it's a curriculum, right? A decolonial curriculum. Um, yeah, how do you marry the two? It is very important. Uh, um, Nagachope had a, a hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Simon. I have not answered that question. Uh, how do you how do you marry these two? Uh, you have to understand first that you know our culture is a or our sense of Itoke identity is a colonial construct, and uh, and that is why a a a, a decolonial curriculum is important. USP is not doing that. The system of education at the university uh, in Fiji is not encouraging a decolonial curriculum. We need to um, we need to develop a decolonial curriculum in order to unpack our identity. Our identity today is a colonial construct. It's it's a lot of things that we need to unpack, and that can be done through a decolonial curriculum. That is uh, you know, 
I'm not happy with that answer. I, I wish I have time to, you know, uh, Penny, you know, I, if I can uh, sit with you and talk about uh, these things with you. As I said, this is the time I'm enjoying my wine. Anyway, what's the next question? Chope, what's your question? <laughs> Matata. <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much, Vinavalevu. Nogutaru. Just my question. Uh, I was wondering, Tai, if you can explain, considering these are the problems of uh, colonization and the capitalist economic system, what would be the, it's a very complex issue, yes, what would be the, if you were in charge of the current uh, let's say land policy in Fiji, what would be the first step that you would look at in taking one step closer to, uh, in a way, maybe decolonizing the land tenure system or something of that sort to overcome at least the, the, easy, the, the major problem that you see? Yeah. From your dissertation, as you've explained, it, it seems to me that uh, obviously this NLTB is very much in need of uh, reform. And then that's the institutional element, and then our social structure in itself. You know, how do you uh, our communal nature versus individual uh, property rights and so on? So I just thought, if you were in charge of our land tenure system, uh, what would be your first step? No, <laughs> Thank you, thank you, uh, Thank you, Tai. Uh, uh, Okay, uh, yeah, again, that's a complicated question. Let me, let me say this, that, you know, to preface my answer to that. Let me say that, um, you know, the land tenure system today, the land tenure system that is operating today in Fiji, it took 60 years to build the land tenure system. The British colonized Fiji for 96 years. Out of that 96 years, the British colonial government took 60 years to build this land tenure system that Chop is referring to. It took 60 years. What did they do with that land tenure system? First, there was a process called land registration. You need to register the land before you can lease it. So land registration was a process of mapping the land. Map the land to identify the land boundaries of each Matangali. They created the Matangali as the land owning unit. They created the boundary. And they also um, uh, created this uh, after after the land after land was registered after sixty years of land registration. Then they then they establish what was called what is called today the native land trust board. Today it's called the Ethiopian land trust board. And so the Ethiopian land trust board then you know um, institute uh, a leasing arrangement, right? Okay, uh, that leasing arrangement. Uh, was meant to make the best part of the land available to Fijians of Indian ancestry, to Indians who came through the indenture system. You know, they came as the indenture system. After they were uh, freed from the indenture system, they were given 10 acres each as independent sugarcane farms. So in 1940, the sugarcane, uh, there was this, the, the Ethiopian Land Trust Board was established to administer the leasing arrangement, right? And so the land tenure system today is tailor-made to the sugar industry, to the tourism industry, to the real estate development industry. The land tenure system is meant to make the best part of native land available to foreign investors, to non uh for profit through an institutional leasing arrangement administered by the Itoke Land Trust Board, right? And where do indigenous Fijians feature in this? They feature in the native reserve. All the villages, they live in villages and native reserve, right? Think about this, to the 103 people who are participating today, think about this. When you get off at Nandi Airport, 
You get off at Nandi Airport, right? The airport is one of the best airports in the world. It's a first world, it's a first class airport. You get off at the airport, you get in the bus or taxi or rental car, and then you drive, you leave the airport. And you see the residential places, beautiful. The best part of Fiji you see, and then you come to the farms. It's wonderful, you see the beautiful homes. You know, you see the, the farms. And then you enter the first Fijian village. That what happens to the scene? The scene changes. You see substandard homes, you see, you know, unmaintained homes. Yet these are the landowners. Right? These landowners, they live in the villages by virtue of belonging to the Matangani. They do not have contractual rights of access to the land through lease. What you see, you know, the residential places that you see, the farms that you see, the airports that you see, those are, those are land that were offered, that were given through lease arrangement. It's a contractual leasing arrangement given to those who lease the land the airport, the residential places, the farms, right? They have legal rights of access to the land. These are the people who have the, the who enjoy the capital value of the land because they can use the lease to, you know, to secure development loans for commercial agriculture, for real estate development, or for any other kind of commercial adventure, uh, ventures. Those in the villages, they do not have that right. They only have customary right of access that is not registered. The bank does not recognize that customary right of access. If a villager goes to a bank and says, listen, I want to, can you give me a loan to refinance my house? In the village, the, the, the bank will say, do you have a lease title? They don't. They do not have private property rights to the land in the village, as opposed to the lessee, right? To an Indo-Fijian or to a Chinese or to an American, Australian, New Zealand investor who has a lease title, who has contractual rights of access to land through lease. This is a contractual arrange arrangement agreement that is recognized by the banks, recognized by the modern economy. Indigenous Fijians in the village, they do not have that access. So the first thing that I, you know, the first thing that needs to be done is to reform this land tenure system, to allow indigenous Fijians to lease their own land so that they can enjoy the capital value of the land. You know, capitalism, you know, as much as we critique the capitalism, as much as we hate it, you know, I teach at the university, we critique capitalism. We critique it left, right, and center. Capitalism is bad. Capitalism is disempowering. Capitalism is marginalizing. Capitalism is dispossessing. But as much as we critique it, you and I find ourselves participating in it. So capitalism is here to stay. The issue is how do we navigate ourselves around capitalism? One of the ways of doing that is to, to reform the, the land tenure system to allow indigenous regions to lease their own land so that they can be economically empowered through a lease title, through private property rights. Does that make sense? Yeah. Don't know, don't know here. If yes. I become prime yes. minister, I'll change the land tenure yes. system. But yes. this is the problem. This is the problem with the land tenure system. The land tenure system is tailor made to, sugar, to the sugar industry, even though the sugar industry has declined tremendously. Today, the sugar industry only constitutes five percent of GDP. Right? The sugar, the land tenure system is tied to the sugar industry, to the tourism industry, to the land ten, to the real estate development industry. Right? And so, if you if you, if you tweet or if you reform the land tenure system, you run the risk of compromising the economic survival of the Fijian state. You run the risk of bankrupting the economy. But to you, 103 people who are, who are tuning in today, that is, your, that is your call. You need to figure out a way of reconciling the economic survival of the Fijian state and at the same time economically empowering indigenous Fijians who are the right, who are the owners of the means of production, the owners of the land. That's a call of leadership in Fiji today. How do you reconcile maintaining the economic survival of the Fijian state, the economic base of the Fijian state, of the plural society, of Fiji as a nation, how do you reconcile the economic survival of Fiji's plurality and at the same time the economic empowerment of indigenous Fijians? 
The economic empowerment of, the economic empowerment of indigenous Fijians is not a race issue. It's an issue of economic justice. It's an issue of political justice. So, Chopi, you're asking me, what would I do? Reform the land tenure system in favor of indigenous Fijians. Allow the economy to bankrupt. Let the economy bankrupt first, and then we can rebuild it. At least this time in favor of indigenous Fijians. Navaliu, Navaliu. Does anyone else have a question? I believe you one in Ben had a question. Mulubina Kayabunuai, Nangunga Tanyala, Amontilio. You had mentioned that um, we need to reform the land tenure system in Fiji. Um, even we as Fijians are struggling with the land lease ourselves. Um, so, 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 what's the last one? The last sentence? Okay, many Fijians are struggling with the, trying to get land leased to us by our, within ourselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. So my question is, what is in place? Because, <clears throat> for example, in my situation, we feel like um, the land that is written to Amatangali is not in our names. With that being said, we have to, even if we're trying to get into agriculture, we'll have to somehow find, finally lease land from another Itoke. Mm. So <clears throat> my question is, what is there in place if we are facing such? Because even if we go to our villages, like um, Bali the had mentioned there, eh? but <clears throat> this is one of the struggles that Itoke has faced that we are trying to go back <clears throat> to the villages during this pandemic and there is nothing there for us. Mm. So my question is, how can we deal with these type of situations where we're trying to come back to claim our land that <clears throat> is supposedly to be mm -hmm. for us, but now yeah. we have no choice, but we'll have to go and lease land somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, you know, the, <laughs> unfortunately, we have to go back to subsistence agriculture. Because that's what indigenous Fijians have been positioned historically to be perpetual subsistent farmers until the end of the world. While non Itaukeis are positioned to be, you know, commercial farmers, um, entrepreneurs with the usage of Itauke land, right? Until and unless you change that, we will continue to be perpetual subsistent farmers. So you're asking me, you know, you go back to the village, you know, you know, we go back to subsistent farmers. Because if you want to lease your Matangani land, there are institutional constraints. See, th think about this, think about this. Uh, um, if a, a Chinese, all right, uh, you know, this, this is a very sensitive thing. Abdul, I'm sorry, right? I, I don't want to be discriminatory here. But land no, please is go ahead. Such, it's an open discussion. Yeah, land is such a sensitive thing because, you know, when you talk about indigenous Fijian land, you're talking about the intersection of a race, of races. It's okay, Indians, now you have Chinese, and now you have other, you know, uh, um, racial groups coming in, right? And so, uh, in your Matangali, if, uh, you know, if an Indo-Fijian wants to lease the land, that Fijian doesn't go to your Matangali. Because your Matangali doesn't control your Matangali land. The Native Land Trust Board or the Itaukei Land Trust Board controls your land. That is stipulated in the Native Land Trust Act. Section 3, if you have time, Google that land act. Read it, familiarize yourself with it, right? The control of all native land shall rest with with, with an Itaukei Land Trust Board, the control. That means the DLTB has the right to determine who to lease your land, not you, not your Matangali, not your Evusa, the TLTB. And so this is a predicament that needs to be changed. You know, it's young people like you who need to reform this land tenure system. And so my question, my answer to you, you know, you go back to subsistence farming. Because that's what's available to you in your native reserve. You are not positioned as a commercial agriculturalist. You are not positioned as an entrepreneur in the land tenure system. You are seen as a black slave. You are seen as indigenous person. The British sees you, they it okay as somebody who is unenterprising. 
devoid of entrepreneurship. And that's why your position in the Native Reserve as a perpetual subsistence farmers. Thank you. You've actually answered my question, Minaka. Dr. Daniel. Yeah, this thing make me angry, you know? <laughs> we need to change that, you know? And I'm glad that Sabe, you know, uh, organizes this forum. These are some of the things that, you know, you need to, you young people, you need to resolve this. You, know, you need to figure out how do we reconcile the economic survival of the Fijian state. When we talk about the Fijian state, you're talking about a, a democratic plural society, indigenous Fijians, Fijians of Indian ancestry, Chinese, other races. How do you reconcile the economic survival of the Fijian state and the economic empowerment of indigenous Fijians? Not through affirmative actions, not through giving them fish, but teaching them how to fish. So uh, to recap, Dr. Pony, what you're saying is uh, there's this illusion for landowners that they own the land, even though when the land is leased from you from 99 years, that's like almost three generations of, of, uh, of Itauke land being dispossessed for that period of time. That, that yeah. means maybe me and my children and maybe their children Absolutely. Will not be privy to those to that land because the lease yeah. agreement is for 99 years. Yeah. So there's this illusion that they gave us that oh you're still uh, the owner of this land even though that's not really yeah. the case. But they've developed this sophisticated system based on what you said. They've done 60 years of uh, of uh, studying how this works, and I believe I also did uh, my thesis on this where I, I talked about how um, they've already studied what happened in the Caribbeans where the indigenous people. Um, uh, 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 um, went against the colonial masters and when they came to Fiji they had already learned their lessons so instead of them having us work the fields they brought in indentured laborers and created this wedge between us to, to maintain this paternalistic system where they were still at the top of everyone else so um, giving us this illusion that we're still ownership of, uh, we still are owners of the land is, is you're saying it's not really the case, correct? Yes, absolutely. And so, you know, let me finish that scenario. You know, if uh, if uh, if uh, a non okay wants to lease your land, say a foreign investor in the tourism industry wants to invest, or you know, uh, a Fijian of Indian ancestry, or a Chinese with Fiji citizen wants to lease the land, he doesn't go to the landowners. He goes to the TLTB, right? The TLTB has the right to lease the land without necessarily take note of this without necessarily soliciting the consent of the landowners. You have nothing in the land tenure system. TLTB has the absolute control to lease your land. It doesn't need your consent. But take, on the other hand, if a member of the Matangali wants to lease a land from his, his or her Matangali, you don't go to the TLTB. You go to the members of the Matangali, you take uh, a Tambua or, or Angona, you go and ask them, I want to lease the land outside of the native reserve. 99% of the time, your members of the Matangali will disagree. Why do you want to go and lease when you, can, when you just have this? Just go and plant. But we live in the 21st century. We need capital to develop any kind of land, right? And so these are constitutional constraints because it is meant for indigenous, to make it difficult for, indigenous, for members of the Matangali to lease their own land. Confine them in the native reserve, confine them in villages, confine them in subsistence agriculture, confine them in economically debilitative space, exclude them from the modern sector of the economy. Indigenous Fijians do not participate directly in economic production. <laughs> You know, that's not a racist question. Do we have any more questions? Thank yeah, you. I have a question. Hold on, let me get a glass of wine. <laughs>
So we have year one, and who else wanted to ask a question? We'll just ask it all at once before talk um, gets uh, yeah. uh, inebriated before we finish this uh, discussion. Yeah. Yeah, Hello, uh, doctor. Just uh, first of all, uh, I'm Miwani. When I'm based in the Marshall Islands, so. Um, <clears throat> It's my first year here, and um, I was just following your discussion on colonization. Yeah, go ahead. And then um, from Fiji, if we go to Fiji, to Australia, to New Zealand, we see the different stages in the increase in uh, development in those countries. Um, in my case, I came to a to Marshall Islands, which is not as advanced as Fiji. The currency is uh, USD, but uh, I'd have to say that uh, uh, I think because of uh, colonization and economic activities, we're pretty much in a good state, development wise compared to the Marshall Islands. But I, I, I still agree with all what you've, what you've uh, said earlier about colonization and its issues. Um, but that's something I've come to uh, be grateful of, and the education system in Fiji, all that we've come through. Um, just uh, one thing that uh, I noted that uh, on the reformation of laws in Fiji is something that is really challenging. I mean, as an accountant and as a uh, previous auditor from Fiji, um, I do know a lot about the Companies Act and um, I think some of, uh, b due to the fact that the current laws uh, <coughs> or reformation of laws is something that's close to impossible to achieve in Fiji with the current uh, governance, uh, one way in which we as Itoki people that we can work around this is uh, uh, joining forces, I mean, linking with our Matangali members, uh, bringing people together uh, in the local, in, in our language, we call it Solsolovaki, in the Solsolovaki Meva Wonitoki. And one way that uh, gives us an opportunity is we can register our Matangali as a business, make it legitimate. Once we register our Matangali as a business, we are able to lease the land, lease our own Matangali land, and we can use that as basis of taking loans to encourage our business. Um, proposal with banks and um, because the mere fact of the matter is that we talk okay, right now we are asset rich but uh, cashless and I think in this stage I just want, wanted to get a feedback from you what, or, or what is your take on this matter and this is since the law is um, hard to reform right now and uh, due to governance um, the possible solutions which we should perhaps look into and move forward on, um, like um, creating, uh, registering your Matangali as a business, making it uh, legitimate and bringing your people together. So, so in the we can form business proposals and move forward. And um, yeah, I think that's, that's something I wanted to raise up with you. Thank you. Thank you, Yohane. Uh, you know, um, your question uh, shows that, you, you know, you've been reflecting on this and uh, thank you for that. I, I want you to rethink about your statement about, um, you know, the economic development. You said you're grateful about the economic, the level of economic development in Fiji in comparison to the Republic of the Marshall Islands, right? Uh, you know, I, I also taught at the College of the Marshall Islands for three years. I lived in the Marshall Islands in Mojo. And um, I see that there are a lot of comparisons between, you know, Marshallism in the Marshall Islands and uh, it's okay in Fiji in terms of land dispossession, economic marginalization, and all the rest of that. So I want you to rethink about your notion of this development. See, the kind of, see, see Fiji, when you talk about Fiji as a region, Fiji, when you think about it in terms of regional economic development, is the most economically developed 
island country in the region, in the South Pacific, excluding Australia and New Zealand, right? Now, that economic development is tricky because that economic development, that, that, that standard of economic development does not necessarily translate to the economic development of indigenous Fijians. Indigenous Fijians are perpetually economically marginalized in villages in the native reserves. So there's a big disconnect about that, right? Yes, you should be proud of the educational system in Fiji. One of the things that the British uh, relinquished to you know, post-colonial government was an excellent uh, system of education. But that system of education, Iowane, is a system of education that perpetuates what's called the Anglo-American knowledge systems. The Anglo-American knowledge systems that promotes white privileges, that promotes the exploitation of the environment, that promotes everything else but the interest of indigenous Fijians. So this is, this is an educational system that needs to be decolonized. We need to decolonize an educational system, that educational system, and develop an educational system that celebrates indigenous Fijian knowledge system, that celebrates indigenous Fijian experiences, both colonial experiences and post-colonial experiences. We need an educational system that celebrates and promotes indigenous Fijians and everything about being an indigenous Fijian, right? And, and the second thing about your issue, which is very important about what my thoughts are on the, if I heard you correctly, you said that indigenous Fijians are assetless and cashless. Am I correct? And you know, you know, it's absolutely true. We are assetless and cashless, right? And how do we reform it? I, um, we need, I, I, you know, your idea of Sol Solvaki. Idea of Sol Solvaki is good. It's viable. We can do it. One of, the, one of the challenges to that is unity, right? We need to have, you need to, you know, uh, uh, work very hard to unite members of the Matangali to agree to these kinds of things. In my experience, one of the challenges is this unity. One of the challenges is distrust. One of the challenges is the constant suspicions of members of the Matangali against each other. You know, indigenous regions, we are very distrusting people. And so your challenge in promoting the Sol Solovak is how do you, how do you um, secure trust amongst members of the Matangali? How do you secure unity? How do you articulate a vision, right, for the members of the Matangali to be united behind and work for, for a common good in terms of the Matangali? That's my response to your question. <clears throat> Dr. Dr. Ponya, I believe we talked about um, Sol Solevaki, uh, yes, uh, two days ago. Um, about, uh, I think the segues into the next agenda item that we had about um, how are we um, going to brainstorm, uh, basically, how are we going to help our mm -hmm. folks back home who are struggling during this pandemic um, period. And I believe that we've learned that the informal economy is really pulling its weight during this time where farmers, people we often look down to, are, are needed when all the borders are closed and we need to feed people within our borders. So what, what do you, I guess this is open to everyone, what do you guys suggest um, we could uh, put forth to help in, in whatever way we can to the people back home? And this goes for, for people back home too, if you wanna um, uh, chime in. Well, I, I will let others do, uh to speak on that. I've been speaking a lot. Let's, let's hear from others. And what was your question again, Sabah? Hi. Hi, I have a, oh, sorry, what's up? I, I was just saying, how, how can we assist folks, folks back home uh, during this pandemic period, uh, whether it's monetarily or, uh, Maybe we can set up some systems to help uh, aid them in their, um, during this time, uh, sponsoring students or, or whatever. What do you guys think uh, mm -hmm. moving forward? I want to get to action steps where we are actually 
uh, changing this conversation, the discussion into actual tangible ways to help people back home. Can, is, uh, sorry, can I just uh, ask for something? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I'd just like to suggest eh, um, for the diaspora to, one of the things that's overlooked now and one of the things that's in, apparent now in Fiji's economy is that we are heavily reliant on tourism. And the, the sugar industry, everything else is pretty much fallen on its knees. One of the things that's really helping people survive is the remittances. So whatever money that families still send, I think it goes a long way. Uh, a lot of the analysis that's being done shows that the remittances in itself is sustaining a lot of the communal obligations and everything else. So I think if families continue to support their own extended families and keep the remittances coming in, it's actually helping um, a lot of the things that people don't consider. Uh, and especially in the current state of the, of the economy that we, that we have right now. So for instance, um, economists like Professor Warden Nasi and various others have estimated that about 300 to 500 million is made out of the remittances that's sent by the diaspora. And that actually goes a long way because of the different things that people have to adjust to. I'm, of course, not suggesting that everybody sacrifice their own interests um, wherever they are in the diaspora, but maintaining whatever that is sent home, I think is, is, is something that helps a lot, especially in terms of the economic structure and various other costs that is going to, that is already on its way now. Okay, so remittances, uh, anything else? Anyone else wanna add? Um, hi, I just wanted to add a different perspective to what was just said. Um, I don't know who it was that uh, said it, but um, I just wanted to add like, the pandemic is also affecting the US as well. So the people that are sending money, um, they might be in a situation where they um, no longer have a job in the uh, circumstance that we are here in the States. So I understand that it is, you know, um, helpful to help your family overseas, but um, you know, sometimes the, our family overseas should also see the perspective of our family that are here in the States that uh, we would be then digging ourselves into debt trying to help the family back home, especially with the circumstances that we are, um, that we are in, in the States. Um, right now we have the highest employment, unemployment that we've ever seen. So I just wanted to put that out as well. But I do um, see where you're coming from with having a uh, family still send money back home and stuff. <clears throat> Thank you, Va. Mm -hmm. I would uh, like to uh, say something. Uh, over here in uh, Fiji. Uh, there's a lot. Um, you know, this, uh, you know, firstly, I, I would personally like to thank uh, everyone overseas, all the Fijians uh, overseas sending money over. You know, it's, it's great to see when we're going past shopping, see, uh, you know, there's people lined up, uh, you know, waiting to get uh, their money out, whether through its em uh, Empire South Western Union. And I just want to uh, say a big thank you to you, gang. It was, uh, you know, I don't know how, how channels work when you, when you donate uh, money, I mean, when you go through certain programs here in the country, but uh, for example, our youth program, before we used to reach out to the members of the HAPS, uh, uh, so we could just go and just give offer, I mean, give food supplies and everything. But now we can't go straight to the families. We have to actually give it to the organization first and they'll distribute it. So that's, so if you are sending money, uh, and I understand everyone's trying to, but if you are sending money, uh, just a big thank you uh, to you guys also. The other most important thing right now that's happening on the ground, and I feel that we don't have much support in, is mental support. Uh, you know, here in Fiji, the culture is, you know, uh, you unemployed, you know, you, uh, for us guys mostly. And, and I, think, I feel that's the biggest problem, biggest uh, contributor to domestic violence we have right now. Uh, and it means a lot. Uh, I know, um, sorry, I should have, <laughs> I shouldn't have been road running. But, uh, 
you know, when you're uh, talking to your families, eh? uh, reach out to them, uh, find out what's happening. Uh, we don't know what struggles we, we're going through, uh, uh, personally, for each eh? And it, it's good to know, or well, it's good to find out what's really happening in the minds of a lot of people. Because, uh, like I mentioned, uh, with this COVID-19, there's also a huge uh, spike in domestic violence. And it's pretty much used with, uh, with us, uh, it okay, Naka. Naka uh, Rupeni, Dr. Pongez is, is excusing himself uh, right now. I believe he's uh, getting impatient and wants to go enjoy his wine. Uh, I think we've all been uh, uh, empowered and fired up with his uh, discussion today. Uh, and I think that's the essence of what we wanted to bring to the fore today, to be able to uh, kind of delve into under the surface of a, a lot of the things that we often take for granted about our identity, about our history, and having someone who actually um, took the time to study it and, and to uh, interrogate his own curiosities about it. I think we're in a really good position right now because we've learned so much in this uh, little bit of time. So I, I, I would like to just uh, thank you, Dr. Pony, on behalf of everyone um, mm -hmm. for taking your time out to do this. And I've also shared your, um, your email to people. So expecting a lot of emails when you wake up uh, hungover tomorrow. Um, so on behalf of everyone, I'd would, I would like to just thank you, um, Dr. Pony for, for um, um, taking this time to, to come and speak to us. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Um, Save, I was wondering if I could add on to the next step forward kind of conversation. Go ahead. Um, one of, yeah, one of the things, and this is a really interesting conversation. We've had this on another call, and this is just a continuation. Um, of course, when we said, how do we help people back home in Fiji, we have talked about remittances. But one of the things that came out through this conversation is the disconnect we have with the political realities that we have in Fiji in terms of governance, laws, and something that came to my mind when I think it was Ioane in the Marshall said, well, how do we find ways around uh, barriers that we have? So uh, Fijians living abroad have got um, special skills or technical, uh, technical skills that could actually help us back home. For example, Ioane mm -hmm. said that as an accountant, he is well-versed. Matangalis could set up companies and therefore they could actually claim ownership, etc. So one of the things that we could actually talk about and do and that we could probably ask for help from you guys overseas is with those technical experiences in trying to uh, better our lives here. And this ties into what Dr. Ponipate said about not uh, giving the fish, but teaching how to fish. Uh, remittances are fine. We do need it right now because uh, there are circumstances which are unable to allow cash flow and income, yes. But in the long term, maybe that's the kind of relationship in terms of helping that we want to cultivate, where we are talking about their skills, their uh, knowledges that exist in Fiji and outside of Fiji by and for Fijians that we could actually use to our benefit back home. Yeah, that's all. Naka Abdul. Before we close, does anyone else want to add to that? So we'll, we'll put this together and. Uh... I think uh, we'll try to announce it in the next meeting if we get a next one going, uh, just to see how we can organize around um, some of these strategies to help people um, back home. <clears throat> Savi, I had a question. Are we trying to do this as a, um, a community here in the U.S.? Is what we're trying to do with how we're going to help people back home or what, what's, what, what are we trying to do? That's the idea. I think it's not only uh, for the U.S., I think it's for Fijians all over the diaspora, the U.K., Australia. Trying okay, to figure could out I just, how, yeah, go ahead. Could I suggest something that we could do? What we could do is uh, we could have Team Twitter Fiji uh, actually find out, you know, like school is coming up right now soon. We'd have single parent families, those that have kids. They could get a list and we could anonymously just <coughs> pitch in for whatever they need to get going for school that's coming up. That's probably how we could just start off. Like try and just get <clears throat> families that have single parents or kids that don't have parents. That's probably for a start, we could do that. <laughs> we could just pitch in or anybody could just sponsor. 
a child or two. Just my suggestion. Then... Sorry, can I just add on to that? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, it's uh, also um, not just the single parent families and uh, those kind of families that are sort of the first ones to jump uh, to the front of your, your brain when you're thinking about those in need, but uh, also there's a lot of families who have uh, parents who lost their jobs during the last few months, yeah? So those might be the ones that are trying to, you know, keep it together or keep it secret from a lot of other family members, trying to m make sure, because we, we're proud people. Eh? Sometimes we don't want to show how hard it is at home to the rest of the family. But uh, just, I don't know, check in on certain family members um, if you can. That's all. Yeah, thank you, uh, Jerry. My question is to, to uh, the folks in Fiji who are tuning in. Uh, would you uh, be able to set up... Uh, a way for us to maybe get us a list of names or families that we can uh, uh, reach out to directly or through you or whatever they're comfortable with um, since you're already there so we can uh, organize wherever we are. Hi, Save. Um, it's Renata here. Hi, Renata. Um, so the FCOST in Fiji, the social services, they have a list of families who are in need of basic household items and we've been working closely with them, a small group of friends and I. So if you're willing to sort of help out, we can um, send this list. Yeah, that'd be nice. All right. Send it over. Thank you. Uh, well, I have a, I have a question. Um, if no one's um, talking, uh, I just wanted to ask. Um, continuing on from what um, Dr. Pony was um, going on about, I wanted to know what wine he was drinking, um, what specific type, and if he could recommend uh, a type of wine for a beginner like me who's sort of interested in getting into the field of uh, winery at 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Thank you. Hey, Meli, I've sent out his email in case you want to email him directly for his uh, uh, wine stuff. I believe he's a pretty um, good wine connoisseur. So reach out to him. <laughs> okay. Okay, since there's no more questions, uh, we'll work on Sorry, some action. I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, one last question. Uh, Savi, I know we, we're not supposed to turn into a political thing, but right now, I mean, for most of you guys there in uh, Fiji, I mean, those, those uh, Fijians living in the uh, US, I mean, your, your thoughts on, the, uh, on politics right now, uh, political parties. Oh. I'll pass this to whoever wants to answer this question. <laughs> what exactly is the question? I mean, your thoughts on, on, on I mean, the current politics, the current political current parties we government. have here in Fiji. Let's not use the uh, current government. We don't know who all is on this page. <laughs> but, yeah, just generally speaking. Naka. <laughs> Then we will give me the break from the past. That is our thing. I didn't know you to answer that. I'm going to shut up because I might swear. It's quite a sensitive. I think I, I believe that uh, many people here belong to different uh, political affiliation and I. Uh, wouldn't be comfortable expressing my political views here. If you want to know what my political views are, my Twitter is on public. And on that note, since we don't have anything else or anyone else asking a question, I think we're going to oh, call I it. I, I just want one last thing. Oh, go um, ahead. Is there anyone in Fiji that can help um, those that are unemployed? that needs a, a bank account because they really have a hard time 
saving money. So um, I've been sending money to various, helping people out, but they are unable to save because they don't have, they cannot open a bank account. If, um, if there's anyone who's listening in who can help, I'd really appreciate it if you can just let me know so that I can let them know how they are able to open bank accounts for savings. That's all. Um, sorry, can I just uh, answer that? For one bank at least, for BSP, you can't open a bank account here unless you can list down who exactly is going to be financing that bank account. I literally just tried last week. So that's that for BSP at least. I'm not too sure about the other two banks. Fabio is saying it's the same thing for Westpac. Hi guys, uh, sorry. Um, yep, I just uh, wanted to uh, make something clear. On my last point, it's not that I'm against government or <clears throat> or anything against against governance. I mean, um, with all that being said, it's just um, uh, for us, this is interesting. We just need to be more smart and uh, approach things on a more solution-oriented kind of kind of thoughts and um, with that being said on our views on political <clears throat> political parties and all that i mean we all have our differences in opinion but at the end of the day um, <clears throat> you look at america you see democrats and republicans against each other it's the same thing everywhere around the world except for communists but our current status here in fiji um if your political party is not at the helm, it doesn't mean that you have to always be against the government. You can always uh, change things from the inside. And that's something that uh, most of my uh, colleagues who I went to school with were currently in the government. Uh, although they don't have the same political views as those leading, it's uh, still, the onus is still on them to go out there and serve the people and how they implement change uh, in their own way or in their own special way, it, it'll be on them. So uh, every dog has its day, every season comes to an end. Um, people in Fiji just hold on, uh, the pandemic will soon phase out and things will come back slowly. Uh, till then, uh, just uh, pray and love one another. And like I said earlier, can uh, it okay most of the time this unity exists within the family within the matangali toko toko and all that and if we can address it then who else will will it, will it be on the next generation uh, it's uh, it's about time for us young people come out of the dark and go back to know know your inheritance know know your true self and uh, link link connect and move forward. Thank you. Naka, Modi, Komo, Tata. Naka, Wali, Biawani. I think we're uh, uh, done for the night. If anyone has any more um, uh, things that they need clarity on, uh, shoot me an email or uh, just hit me up on Twitter or wherever you find this invitation on. Thank you very much for joining, everyone. Thanks, Ave. Thank you, Sabe. Thank you, Sabe. Bye, Puna. Bye, okay, everybody. Thank you. 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 <laughs> Thanks guys for joining in.
all right y'all that is it for the video i hope you guys enjoyed it i truly hope that you guys learned something useful thank you again for dr bonifate for coming on and thank you to my brother save for hosting thank you to team fiji for tuning in and engaging in the conversation and just being really respectful i hope we can continue these meaningful discussions with one another through zoom um in the comment section on social media wherever we are and if you would like to participate you can go ahead and follow me on twitter or instagram at patmari underscore usually have updates on there or you can just go ahead and search your hashtag team fiji to stay updated to get the link when we do have future zoom meetings and these discussions again uh yeah thank you for watching i'll see you guys in my next video